Okay, uh, let's start. So this is the le lecture uh, six in this 3D printing course. So today will be orthopedic cases. And will be a guest lecture by uh, Camilla uh, and Sverdil. So uh, some conflicts of interest. Um, I'm the founder of the Medviso, that as I previously said during the course. So the outline will be uh, orthopedic cases and Sverdil will start and then Camilla will show uh, a case. Um, and then I will do live demo of segmentation of orthopedic case. And then we will, as usual, end with questions and answers. Uh, so let's switch to presenter. OK. Uh, yeah, my name is Sverdil Kieran, and I'm an um, orthopedic surgeon doing research in uh, how to um, find ways to uh, um, restore the biomechanical uh, anatomy and function of uh, hips after total hip replacements. Uh, my problem has always been to try to, uh, in a simple way, describe uh, the different uh, vari vari variables in the anatomy uh, because it's 3D and I'm trying to draw pictures in 2D and doesn't work so well. So I'm going to go through the process that I, I did now since a few months back when I got my first, my, my 3D printer and started with uh, uh, this, this line of uh, 3D imaging. Uh, so these were my, uh, one of my original uh, paintings. Uh, you can see my mouse here probably, so I'm going to try to explain this in 2D, but um, it's probably going to be hard. You don't have to worry if you don't understand, but as, uh, here is the line. It's called longitude and axis of the femur, and we're looking at the femur from the side, and it's a line down the patient. Uh, this is the first centrum at the level of the trunk trochanter uh, another one six centimeters below, then we have this line. Uh, we have the rotational center there, it's a blue dot, and here as well, this is an actual picture where you have the circle, it's the femur, and this uh, section is through the knee, and these two sections are at these levels here. So if you draw a line from the center of rotation to 90 degrees to this longitudinal axis here, you get an intersection point, which is this red one, or this one, or this one. And you get this femoral offset, we call it. And to uh, explain what antiversion is, or proximal femoral neck antiversion, it's this angle that you can see here. And of course, this line is uh, femoral offset. But the problem is to try to uh, explain to people how you put this line. And it's actually a line that is lying on top of a, a plane. And the plane is um, defined by these two points here at the back of the knee, projected on this intersectional point. And then you just put a line 90 degrees from this line and on top of that plane and you get the antiversion angle. So this has been very uh, hard to explain to people and uh, I can um, understand that. I even tried to make a th more 3D-like pictures, picture using 2D, but uh, it didn't do much. So I started with uh, exporting DCOM from uh, the PAX, which is a local server for uh, x-rays, uh, CTs from uh, the pelvis and the femur. And I used the segmenting tool, uh, segment 3D print from Medivisio AB in Sweden. Um, and uh, uh, processed it in Fusion 360. So here we have the different dots of measurements in this file. Um, you can see here that these two dots are the ones there and the intersectional point is up here where the plane goes through 
and the, the rotational center is up here and you have the femoral offset and the line here lying on top of the plane. So now you can see what and the version angle actually is. Um, we we'll have to wait for the video to go on a little bit. But this is to show that these lines are 90 degrees from the proximal longitudinal line of femur. So if you look down this axial here, then you can see the true antiversion angle. Uh, so uh, I continued with the pelvis and in this we have the antiversion angle, the femoral offset and then the astabular offset which is from the midline to the rotational center. And if we compare this picture here with the original picture, you can see the antiversion angle is this one or here on this picture looking at the femur from below. And this is the line on top of the plane I described earlier. This is the femoral offset. It's this one. On 2D you can't see it. You only see the frontal image, which is always shows always a shorter line than it really is. And uh, the astabular offset is here to there. And the combined femoral offset and the antiversion offset, uh, astabular offset is the global offset. So. Here we have a simplified version of this explanation. Uh, so I got help from uh, uh, Bild and Funktionstechnik in Lund, which is uh, the, the ones that help with 3D printing. And uh, they made this model for me for 3D printing. I've colored it and you see the, this line here lying on top of the plane. Um, and uh, here you can soon see the results. So now I have a model which I can, I can just carry around in my pocket. And when, whenever people ask me what I'm talking about, I just show them uh, on the, those models. It makes my life easier. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so I will hand over the control to you. Camilla? Yes. <coughs> yes? Yeah, okay. So hi, um, I'm Camilla De Matos. I'm an orthopedic surgeon within the, um, the tumor section at uh, Skåne University of Chikus. And uh, I'm going to show one case that we 3D print with a 3D team. So this is actually the second case that uh, we did a 3D print for a tumor. The first one um, was not very helpful because it wasn't good planning, but this is good. So this was a 29-year-old male, and uh, not only he had a cerebral, um, spastic cerebral palsy with right hemiplegia because of a uh, um, uh, he had a brain lesion when he was born, and because of that, he used uh, an electric wheelchair with his left side, but he also had multiple hereditary exostosis, and multiple hereditary exostosis is a, a genetic condition uh, that usually gives um, benign uh, osteochondromas in, uh, in the skeleton. And osteochondromas is like uh, bumps that grow from your, from your bone like a tree branch. So usually uh, the patient discovers when, uh, when they're a child and the parents discover it and they grow slowly with the patient, um, but they, they stop growing when the patient becomes an adult. So it's not, uh, they shouldn't grow after that. If they grow after that, it's, uh, it's um, probably maybe it's not going well. So this patient, he was 27 and when, he, when he discovered in his left uh, scapula, there was a, a still growing mass and uh, that grow even faster uh, the last month before he met us at, the, um, at our um, uh, clinic. So clinically, he had a very uh, big 20 by 15 centimeter hard uh, stuck to the scapula mass, but it was movable in relationship with the thoracic wall and it was painless. 
So we did a biopsy, so it's a long story short, <laughs> but we did a biopsy and it showed there was a chondrosarcoma grade two. And a chondrosarcoma is, um, it's a malignancy. So it's a, a cartilaginous tumor, but malignant. And grade two, it's intermediary grade. We have from grade one to three. And this type of tumor is, um, is uh, you need to, to treat them with a surgery. There's no chemo or radiation that is good against this tumor. So the best chance of, uh, of cure is with a good surgery with good margins. Um, so we start our investigation initially with x-ray images. And uh, the scapula in, uh, is, not, um, is not as easy to, to x-ray. As you can see, it's very hard to understand what's going on. Uh, this is, as you can see with my mouse, this is his humerus, um, clavicle acromium, and there you can see a mass that it's hard to understand what's going on. So we order a CT, and this is the coronal view of the CT scan. Um, and you can see there, there's a cardiologinous, we say popcorn type uh, of calcifications. It's really hard, still hard to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, as Vediet uh, showed, we have the option of um, doing 3D ourselves within our, our image system. So we can adjust a little bit the soft tissue. As you can see, this is the patient sitting in, in his uh, wheelchair, not in his wheelchair, but something uh, to do his um, uh, CT scan. And as we adjust the image, we can see that there's this huge mass uh, stuck in his scapula, but still quite hard to understand what's going on. So we decided that it was probably a good idea to 3D print, uh, let's see, this, um, this tumor. And why that? Um, we, so this was his left side, which was uh, his uh, good side, quote unquote, because he, he, he drives his electric wheelchair. So we wanted to preserve the, the shoulder um, uh, articulation. So to save the glenoid region, so it's the, the part of the scapula that articulates with the humeral head. Um, and also, of, of course, to better understand the anatomy and, uh, and the surgery that we are going to do. But different from, uh, from Peter's uh, uh, presentation, it's really hard to estimate how much we gain with 3D printing of the tumor because it's always different tumors in different locations with different anatomy. So it's hard to put a number or an objective measurement on how this is better. But still, we did it. And I sent the, um, the information to Philip, and this is what he sent me the, the, that he was going to print. I believe it took uh, a couple of days to print because we did in a one-to-one one -one scale, so we can have a, a real feel of what, what we had as a tumor. But after that, we did a, an MRI scan, which is very important. Like, we, like I said, this is a, um, a tumor, uh, so it's a, a lot of um, movement artifact in this MRI, so it's not the best to understand what's going on. But you can see there's a huge soft tissue component. And uh, so it's not just this, um, like, you, saw, uh, like you, you guys saw the model, uh, it's not just the, the bony part and the cartilaginous part. There's a lot of soft tissue going on. Um, so we knew that it was um, maybe it was going to be difficult to save the glenoid region, uh, even though we could see from the 3D model that it was probably feasible of doing that. Um, let's see the next slide. So this is the, the model, and we took it to the OR. We studied that um, a lot before we did the surgery. It was a seven and a half hour surgery, very long surgery. So this here was the glenoid region. Uh, unfortunately, here also, this is just to keep the two pieces together, uh, but the acromion and the clavicle, 
Um, and this is what we took off from the patient. So as you can see, this is the glenoid region. So it's a very big, very large tumor, but with a lot of soft tissue. So our 3D print of this tumor, it helped us a lot with the planning, but still it, it's really hard with tumors with, uh, with a lot of soft tissue components that we, we need to plan for that as well. We need to have good margins. So it helped us with the planning, but still we need to develop a better way to look at the soft tissues. And uh, this is the x-ray after uh, the surgery. We were able to leave a little bit of the acromion and, uh, and stitch together a, a, a capsule-like, so he had a little bit of a, a, um, a joint there uh, to, to move a lot, uh, move a little uh, his uh, shoulder. And uh, yeah, that's what we did. Um, we can actually take some questions. Um, so to both uh, Camilla and uh, Sveden. So have you received any questions, Klaus? Yes, we have one question to Sveden here. Uh, and that is uh, uh, from uh, uh, Gabriel Gru, who wonders, how do you primarily show your models? Uh, and who do you sh primarily show your models to? Is it other doctors, physiotherapists, uh, patients? or engineers yeah well mainly uh i'm a consultant for for a, a computer uh, company in uh, gothenburg since uh, many years back and they're um they're uh, making a software for uh, 3d templating uh, so usually we uh, uh, do templating uh, before we do surgery on two-dimensional images, but uh, we're evolving into 3D because, uh, as you can see, uh, you don't get the exact dimensions with 2D. And uh, they are not doctors, so th because I'm doing research in this area since 10 years back, uh, they contacted me uh, and we've been uh, having meetings and I've been trying to explain to them what I mean by antiversion and different leg length uh, and uh, other uh, variables that they should uh, keep to in the system because I have some experience in, in uh, finding ways to make it easier for the computer because it's an artificial, uh, artificial intelligence system to, to uh, place these points accurately. Uh, it has been a problem uh, that I'm trying to explain to them in 3D and they do work for many months and then they come back and it, it, it seems that they haven't listened or, or they didn't understand what I said. So that's why I uh, started trying to make it easier and, and I, I just got this model one week ago. So uh, I haven't actually showed it to them yet, but uh, I'm planning to. Thank you. Uh, so there are no more questions in the chat. Uh, oh, now we have one question. Uh, so this one is to uh, Camilla. Is it possible to print the salt tissue as well? Uh, could you extract this from CT or MRI? So I think this is um, better answered by Aina. Uh, we can do that, and uh, but it's hard to because we need to edit. I think the most important thing is to edit the images correctly. So it's um, it's something uh, as 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 um, knowledgeable as as very with Aina's program but I want to learn that to help um, edit the images so I can choose myself what I think it's important to leave in the soft tissue part and, uh, and, and maybe try to 3D print that. Um, but Aina can talk a little bit more about the, the um, MRI images as we discussed in the, few, in the, first, um, in the first lectures. We, we talked a little bit about that, I guess. 
Yeah, can I add a bit more? So um, um, one thing that we're looking into is to, to fuse the MR images with the CT image so you can get, get both. Uh, so for this kind of tumor, I think it should be doable to see the tumor reading with the MR, uh, if there are these good the MR images. And then you could at least do a segmentation. <clears throat> that, would, that would be an, 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 a separate um, uh, challenge in terms of how you should print it. Maybe you should print it like, um, uh, so the soft tumor is like uh, opaque, and then you can see the bony structures inside that will require the special printers. Uh, and so it's, it's not, this, uh, the combination of soft and hard tumors, um, I think this is a challenge, uh, but uh, something that we really need to look into. And maybe then the printed model plus a VR model uh, for showing the outside of it uh, could be a way forward. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? Uh, please write them in the chat. I, I, I can maybe have one to to uh, to Sverdlir. Um So one of your applications was now for educational uh, purposes. Um, do you think you will use it also for uh, medical doctors or, or training them or or residents etc. to some anatomy parts, uh, or is it enough to, with the surgical experience they they gain? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a great tool for uh, explaining uh, to uh, students or other colleagues and uh, because when you do a hip prosthesis you have all these angles and limitations and if um, in the future you know and I'm working on it to make a model not just of the femur but also a model uh, of both legs with one with a hip uh, stem in it and cup and uh, all the way down to the angle, ankle to explain how leg length is uh, done in the best way. Uh, if you look at the current literature, um, these uh, definitions have been going on since uh, 50, 60 years back and uh, uh, in my opinion uh, they are not good enough. So I think I have um, uh, come to a better way of uh, defining what, how to measure leg length and under version uh, and uh, to be able to convince other more senior doctors that this is the right way, I have to have a simple tool to explain this and maybe a, a, a way to, a model that I can actually change and see how these things um, uh, changes with movement. So I'm working on that. Thank you. Uh, we have some more questions in the chat now. Um, so uh, we have a question from Hanna, uh, and it's addressed to Camilla. Uh, how many cases have you tried? So this was a second case. Um, I, I haven't really printed a lot of tumors, so we have a third one that is uh, cooking, right, Philip? Um, and uh, but the problem is, so sarcomas, um, which is the type of tumors that, that the malignant tumors that we treat, most of them are soft tissue. We do have skeletal sarcomas, but they are they're not as common as, uh, well, sarcomas are not common at all, but uh, skeletal sarcomas are a little bit more uncommon than uh, soft tissue. So we do have a lot of soft tissue sarcomas, and we still haven't found a good way to 3D print them. Um, so I, I try to, to 3D print the, the cases that, are, uh, that, that have more skeletal parts that we uh, that are better to visualize in a 3D print and that have CT scans, but because lots of uh, our sarcomas, uh, we we do we do investigations just with MRIs because they're soft tissue. So still we still haven't found a best uh, a best way the best way to print them, unfortunately. But hopefully in the future. Um, 
Maybe, Philip, you can comment a bit on the plans for, for, for the next case. If you're there. Uh, sure. Uh, so we're doing a uh, another tumor uh, with Camilla. Uh, we are planning to do a clear model for the uh, uh, tumor part, and we will have a one color for bone and one color for vessels, so that the surgeons easily can see where the vessels go uh, in relation to both the tumor and the uh, uh, the bones. Yeah, and this this uh, this case that we're going to print, it's um, so it's a little bit. I think it's a little bit more. Um, it's easier because uh, it's um, it's a case of a, of a, a, a fat tumor, so it's a lipomas tumor. So it, it and it had a CT scan, and not just an MRI. So we were able to, I guess, <laughs> Philip is, uh, and the team is able to select the, the, the tumor because of its density. It has negative density in the CT scan. So it's hard to delineate um, the extent of the, of the tumor and, and also to look at the blood vessel. So um, that's, um, I'm trying to create um, a study maybe um, in the future or near future to to analyze uh, the vascularity within soft tissue tumors um, better than just to analyze the tumor itself which I think it's a problem uh, with uh, Wolf's uh, question uh, not the print material but other but more uh, segmentation of the tumor itself I guess mm -hmm. uh, thank you so let's see, we have a, a question from Mimi here. She, she would like to hear about the, the real use of the AM. Does anyone want to comment on, on that? Um, maybe you mean um, AR, like a augmented reality? Um, or is it? Um, so AM, I'm not sure, uh, but AA, uh, augmented reality. Could you verify that, Mimi, in the chat? Uh, additive manufacturing. Ah, okay. All right, yes, yes. So that's AM. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, that's a, a, a quite generic uh, question, and I think the... It's very hard to, to answer specifically, but if we talk about orthopedic cases, I think it's really for um, um, one of the things that we have seen today is like pre-surgical models to, to understand the, the anatomy, um, maybe with some teaching models. And then I also think that also for orthopedic cases, there will be more and more cutting guides where exactly for, for for where to cut, uh, so that's not the use of it. Um, that's what that's what I think the field will go into. Um, Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of questions popping up here now. So we have uh, we have uh, one from Tim uh, here, which is addressed to Slavi and others. So are you using any kind of biomechanical modeling or analysis on a patient individual basis? Uh, for example, uh, finite element analysis uh, or uh, reconstructing a uh, pain script? No, that's not my, uh, what my research is about. Uh, it has been done. Uh, before and uh, is still continuing to be researched the uh, finitive element, but uh, I'm more interested in um, uh, finding out the actual angles that were changed from before surgery to after surgery uh, and the offsets and uh, the height of the rotational center leg length difference and see if that gives any correlation to 3D gait analysis, how the prosthesis moves within time, because different lever arms might give, give a difference 
in um, uh, hip reaction force. We're not actually measuring the hip reaction forces. We're just mas mas measuring the, the difference in uh, antiversion and offsets to see, for example, what, what we aim to do is to make the hips symmetrical. Uh, usually when you have a <clears throat> one-sided arthrotic hip, you want to uh, uh, make it like it was before, and then you usually have the healthy hip as a reference. Uh, so that's what it's about. So, uh, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment if they're working or something? We should maybe take uh, some of the, we have one more question here. Uh, or we have a comment from Finn here, so it says, okay, uh, thought of a further application would be to pre, to, uh, to uh, pre-operational planning by extending FEM analysis. That's interesting. So um, uh, we have another question here from Hanna to everyone. Uh, how do you think a CT scan be better designed for the task? The intravenous contrast is not always used for musculoskeletal CT, but might it help in segmenting tissue. What do you think, Camilla? Well, we when we order um, a CT scans for for tumor cases, we usually order them. We if we suspect of malignant cases. We usually order them with contrast, uh, so that's um, that's something that we do for tumors. And uh, regarding, I think Aina can uh, answer this a little bit better. But as I understand, well, CT scans they have a thinner uh, slices of the images, and uh, and the way that the images are processed, it's uh, it's easier to process them with uh, with the program, um, as we discussed. Uh, earlier, but Einer can um, uh, can talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. Um, so, um, yes, I, th I think contrast can be a really good way, and I think, for instance, sometimes it can be good to have both a non-contrast and, and a contrast image, uh, so you can, uh, in, this, in that sense, quite easily either subtract them uh, and only get the vessels, uh, and if you want to ve get venous uh, vessels, you also want to have a multi-phase uh, uh, contrast uh, images. Um, so that's something that I think will be everything that can help us in the segmentation process uh, is really good. So, uh, I mean, ideally, we, we would like a, a magical scanner that tells us that all of this tissue will have this intensity and uh, the, the tissue of this type will have another intensity. That, that's the, the dream scanner we would like. And sometimes you can use contrast agents to help us do that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so. See, we have no new yeah. questions in the chat. And maybe then I should do some uh, hands-on segmentation to show you a bit on how, how you would go about segmentation uh, if bone and bone. <laughs> okay, uh, I open a case from the patient database. Uh, so this will be uh, a foot with an injury. I will start with the, the healthy side uh, and show the basic idea of the segmentation. So first I go to the 3D printing uh, mode of the software. I show you a bit of this uh, in, the, in the third lecture, I think it was. So just to recap, so here we have transversal different views of the feet, like from this, different angles. Uh, to segment bones, we typically want to adjust uh, our threshold. So this is a mapping on how pixel intensities in the CT image are mapped to uh, if it's included in segmentation or not. So everything that is colored will be included.
And before, uh, what I've done before, as a pre-process on this image, is that I have cut, cropped the image and then I make it uh, isotropic, so the pixels are the same size in all directions. So what I do now, I create a threshold. Um, so basically, I take uh, everything that's above uh, this house of value will be included, and uh, there's a slope here. You might see some small, small red dots here. So there are sort of noise that are incorporated in the image. So what I can do now is I can take away and I have only uh, the, the very large part. Uh, so now uh, we, we already now have uh, something that we can display on the screen in 3D. Something like this. Uh, we can see here that we get a bit part of the noise. So one way we can do is we can actually click on this and say that we want to keep only this object. So then we only get the noise part. And now we can uh, take these two parts and remove what we call the, what was the noise part, so delete that. And then we only get the bone part. Already now we can see that it starts to get a lot of objects here. So when I work uh, in, in, in the software, uh, I frequently um, try to clean this number of objects. Uh, so we can delete all of these objects, we don't need them. Okay, see the image here. Uh, and here, this will be quite hard to 3D print because there, there are lots of voids inside the objects. So the printer will be um, needed to add support material in here and it will be quite hard and take a lot of time. It really also depends if it's possible at all, depending on the, which type of printer you have. Uh, so one tool of uh, solving this okay, is uh, this is something called the close operation. So here I can decide how how, how large uh, close operation uh, I, I'm doing. So maybe three pixels is uh, three voxels. Uh, so it tries to close whole holes that are smaller than three uh, voxels. Uh, we can see that the disadvantage of doing that is it. It really closes things here um, and closes here, but also it bleeds some of the parts together. Uh, so it really depends on if this is a suitable operation, depends on what you want to do later. So apply this. Um, okay, and we can see it's slightly more, more filled. Uh, and now, we can go to the 3D mode and I can click fill. So we try to fill more. Uh, so basically, uh, the fill procedure now tries to see if there are any place that I cannot get to, those needs to be filled. So it's managed to fill uh, the bone here. And we can see here uh, that there are parts that are uh, not completely filled. And we can look in 3D and see how that will look. So if you look at the 3D model, it looks really good. So for visualization purposes, this is uh, definitely good enough. If we turn out around here and see, uh, where are we? Yeah. So here, so here you can see part is part of, of, of the bones that are not filled. Um, Let's, let's, let me, oh no, I can show here. On the full screen, so it's easier for you to see. Uh, yes, so here, here we, here if we look carefully, you can see there's a hole in here. Let's go back. So uh, now we want to, to fill these holes. So we can maybe start, we can actually do that in, uh, I think it's best to do it in this view. Uh, and then there's a tool here uh, that, uh, what I call the patch tool. So it, it looks 
and here let's see it tries to figure out uh, that this part should be filled and especially in the in, in the Here. Uh, here you can see it, where it typically leaks in. So I try to just the size of it. And here, uh, and sometimes it's hard to really see should there be bone or should there not be bone here. So sometimes I take away the contour here. Uh, so here should not be bones. Here this should be filled. This should be filled. And here. And here really depends on, on uh, uh, the quality of CT and the quality of the bone. But you, you get the principle here, what, what I'm trying to achieve. See. Still not completely, but it should be now. I can also use a trick that I only fill in 2D. Uh, that sometimes really helps. Okay, so uh, now we have a quite finished uh, foot. Uh, and now we can see we have, we have these parts of the bones that have been bleeding together. Um, we can address, address this. Uh, so what we can do here is we can actually do some, uh, local thresholding. So we just point in the 3D image and then we'll uh, make a small touch up there. So if I want to, I can really uh, highlight these uh, changes if they are, are uh, important to me. Uh, and this really depends on, on the users of the model. And sometimes you want a model where you can actually sort of really take the bones apart and especially for some joints, uh, the glenoids and, and things. Some of the models, there's no problem if, it, if it's stuck together and some you want to, want to be able to remove it. So for instance, one of the models that I think Camilla requested was that we should be able to separate the two objects. Um, and then there are other tools there for uh, being, being able to here uh, separate objects. Uh, and maybe before printing, what I would typically would do is uh, put some uh, spoofing. So, one meters or something like that, let's see. 
then have something that we could uh, print. Uh, yes, and we can. Uh, and I can here, uh, by left click on, on these arrows, I can rotate uh, around them. Uh, and to create this model uh, to print it, um, uh, I need to uh, select uh, which I want to print. And now it creates uh, a surface uh, representation of it. Oops. Sorry. Uh, and then I can just uh, create the SDL file. Well, let's, let's actually do it. One thing that's really important um, in uh, in 3D printing, uh, if you started to do more cases, is that to really give your models a better name than final. Uh, that's, that's a very common name that I have. So I'm, I'm stop doing that uh, when I do live ca real cases. Okay, are there any questions so far in the chat? Um, um, uh, I would like to make a question, Einar. Um, I think we discussed this previously, but since it, this is like orthopedic cases mm -hmm. and you show the a foot, um, mm -hmm. we discussed it also the, the possibility of printing um, models that are we can uh, saw them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, so if you can talk a little bit on the trying to what's the best i don't know density or like plast uh, type of plastic to use to to yes. try to saw them mm -hmm. uh so um i think you need to correct me here uh, philip but uh, magnus uh, is one of the surgeons that have been using the, this uh frequently and then we're printed in uh, pla um uh, and that's been working quite good to to, um, to to saw. So typically, for for those cases, we print one um, one of the, the the foot that is healthy, and then the, the deformed foot, uh, and typically three copies. And then he uses those to try out different uh, strategies for, for for cutting. Maybe you want to comment more, Philip. Uh, yes, so it it was not uh, Magnus, but uh, they, I have uh, been in contact with two different uh, orthopedic surgeons. Uh, we've used uh, PLA, and we've also tried different uh, uh, densities on the on the models. Uh, but we were, I have found that about twenty five percent infill has been enough. I've also tried uh, the the problem is that if you have a too fine blade. Uh, you can start melting the plastic as you saw through it instead of cutting it. Uh, so if you have a low density and a, a rougher blade, uh, you can cut very, very good through PLA. Uh, I've also tried using a band saw, a big saw, uh, and that also worked fine. Uh, the, the main problem is uh, that maybe you don't uh, uh, copy how uh, the bone really works because uh, it's in some parts of the foot it could be very hard to cut since it's so hard uh, but you can give it, get an idea on how to do your surgery uh, with the PLA model and it's also very cheap to do so uh, we've I've made like uh, you make one left one right foot and then you make a mirrored from the a healthy foot to the uh, to the bad foot uh, so you can see uh, more detailed on what you need to uh, address in the uh, surgery. Uh, so a typical foot model can take about 16 to 20 hours to print, depending on uh, how you uh, uh, how you segment it or how big you want it. Uh, so basically, it's just a few days before you have your uh, models ready to be used. Mm -hmm. And uh... Other questions so far? Um, what I can do, since I have one or a few minutes left, 
um, I can I saw that for instance for this model uh, what we did um, what I forgot to do is uh, here so for the other uh, toes uh, they they were removed we can remove uh, the big toe as well to do that I typically just click uh, select here and then I select this part is what, what I want to keep and then I right click uh, and cut it away so we might it's good to see in the 2d image and see if i got yes and then i can take uh on the largest part and then I have uh, the toe there okay any final uh, questions no. nothing in chat so far uh, then uh, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention uh, and I will email out uh, a link for today's uh, recorded lecture and um, the link for, for next lecture. So, thanks for today.